Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. At Issue tonight, the state of obesity. It's a big problem in Mississippi and it's expected to get worse if current trends continue. Our state is third in the nation behind West Virginia and Arkansas when it comes to the highest rates of adult obesity. At present, one out of every three people in Mississippi is obese. According to the State Department of Health's 2016 Obesity Action Plan, the rate of obesity among adults has more than doubled since 1990, going from 15 percent to 35.5 percent. Per capita medical costs for individuals with obesity is $2,741 higher than for those whose weight is considered normal. MPB's Karen Brown spoke with Dr. Dan Jones at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Dr. Jones is Director of Clinical and Population Science at the Mississippi Center for Obesity Research. He tells us why obesity has become such an enormous problem in our state, who is at risk, and what can be done about it. In this country, why are we obese? But specifically in Mississippi, why are we obese? Well, it's a complicated question, is it not? We weren't obese 50 years ago, at least not many of us were. This is a modern phenomenon, it has to do with our lifestyle more than anything else. Uh, there are uh, big changes in the way we eat now, uh, and there are big changes in the way we exercise. So 50 years ago, people uh, lived on farms, 50, 70, 80 years ago, uh, they exerted energy to get their food. Now we go to the grocery store and buy our food and we have jobs not out in the fields working but we have jobs that allow us to sit at tables and work on computers. And, and we used to go outside and play when I was a kid. Exactly. Now the kids are mostly inside and yeah so our lifestyle has changed a lot and uh, so that's why as a society we're getting heavier uh, than in the past. Mississippi is uh, you know uh, uh, it, it's uh, uh, really interesting to think about why so much in the Deep South and in Mississippi. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of scientists think that it's because of the heat, you know, where that was an advantage when we were working outside and we didn't have air conditioners. Now we have air conditioners and so we tend to live inside in the Deep South and so we tend to exert less energy than people who are outside more. So if you were outside working, you needed more food? because you were perspiring that's, energy? Or? That's, well, not just perspiring, but you were burning up calories when you were outside uh, doing things. And then, of course, uh, Mama's cooking has a lot to do with it, too. We like uh, calorie-dense foods in the South, and, you know, Mama's cooking is good for Sunday lunch, but not so good for our health. We had real food a number of years ago, and now there's a lot of processed food. How do those two compare? Well, the processed food is more calorie dense. It tends to have more fat in it, more carbohydrates. And so the, the processed food tends to be uh, denser calories. And so if we eat the same volume of food uh, uh, as opposed to real food, we're not getting as much roughage. We're getting more dense calories, more fats, and so forth. Who is more likely to be obese in Mississippi? Well, it, it, there are gender and racial differences. And uh, so if you are a black female, you're more likely to have the genetic predisposition to be overweight or obese than if you're a white female or a white male or even a black male. Uh, not much differences uh, on the male side between, uh, between races, but there are significant gender and race differences uh, regarding black women genetics that then does play a part? Yes, so it's uh, genetics is, uh, is a part of things. It's not the cause of our epidemic. If you want to understand that, just look at our pets. Our pets are obese as well and they don't share genes with us. Uh, it, it, but, but there are individual differences in genetic uh, predisposition. So let's, let's, let's take Africans. Uh, if you're an African living in rural Africa, you have genes that predispose you to being obese, but there are very few obese people in rural Africa because they still are gatherer hunters. Uh, they still expend a lot of energy and they eat real food. Urban Africans are heavier. They're more obese people. If you take that same genetic profile person and move them to the Caribbean, uh, then that person will be more obese, more likely to be obese. If you move them to Mississippi, 
then the odds are really strong because they're going to be in an environment where there's a lot of calorie dense food and where people don't exercise as much. Is an overweight child an overweight adult? You know, it doesn't have to be, but it does predict it. And so it's important that we do all that we can to prevent obesity in children because it does follow you into adulthood. It doesn't mean that if you're an overweight child that it's inevitable that, you know, that you, you shouldn't try to lose weight. Uh, but yes, uh, your weight as a child has a strong influence on your weight as an adult. That's because of the surroundings you live in? Well, it's, it's part of it is the surroundings you live in, and then uh, there's that genetic predisposition that we talked about. Uh, and, and then when we're young, we're not only putting fat into fat cells, we're making fat cells. And so if we are overweight or obese when we're young, we actually have more fat cells to get fatter as we get older. And so it's really important to control weight in adolescence. I've never heard that before. Yeah. We're producing fat cells. When do we stop producing fat cells? Yeah. When, we, when we stop uh, getting smarter and <laughs> growing, uh, you know, that stops somewhere around uh, uh, late adolescence and early childhood. Yeah. And you produce more fat cells if you're already overweight. Yes. So th there are fat cells that are produced when we're, when we're young. And if you take in more calories, the body wants to give you more storage spaces for it. So, you know, one of the very difficult things about obesity is our bodies were designed to gain weight because we were designed to live in a culture, in an environment where we had to go hunt our food or to raise our food and to eat real food. We weren't designed to live in the kind of culture and environment that we live in now. And so uh, everything about your physiology makes you want to gain weight and to hold on to that weight. And so yes, your, your body responds what we used to think of in positive ways it would allow you not to starve to death along the way when you you know when you experience the famine uh, but uh, yes now it's a huge disadvantage in today's society when you lose weight do you lose the storage space as well sadly no sadly no once once you make those cells they're with you for life and uh, that's one of the reasons that you know it's difficult uh, for adults who were obese as children to manage their weight well when they're adults. All right, now I want to ask you some fact or fiction okay. questions. She's just big boned. <laughs> well, we, are, we, are, we are built differently, are we not? Yes, and there are people who are different body shapes and uh, some of that is, uh, you know, family history, some of that is uh, genetics otherwise, but there are people who are shaped to carry more weight. So look at the National Football League. Uh, there are some very, very big people there, if you measure their body mass index, their height and weight compared, they, you know, looking at their BMI, it would look like they were obese, but they're these really fit specimens because they've got big bones and they can carry. And we need to talk about BMI, yeah. body mass index. Right. It's, it's a formula. What is that formula? It adjusts your body weight by height. So, you know, it allows us to uh, make some predictions about what your health will be relative to your weight and your height. So BMI is just a convenient index and it's frequently used in research but it's also used in clinical practice to help people understand what would be a good place for them to aim. So for a person who's six and a half feet tall their target body weight wouldn't be the same for a five foot two. Does person. muscle play a part in that muscle, formula? Muscle, muscle does not get accounted for in BMI. BMI is a rough estimate of things but there is a measurement that helps us make better predictions. It's not muscle mass, that's a little bit harder uh, in clinical circumstances to, to calculate and measure. But waist circumference is a really important addition to BMI to know about your health relative to fat or weight. You've already addressed this at some level, but it runs in my family. Yes. If everyone in the family is overweight, chances are you'll be overweight as well. Yes, so I've used the word predisposition a lot in this interview so far, and if your uh, family history is for people to be overweight or obese, it's more likely that you will be. You'll be, you'll be more likely, but it doesn't mean you have to be overweight or obese. Uh, there is a genetic component to it, but genetics don't drive the whole thing. It doesn't make us hopeless. What about I exercise and eat less but I don't lose weight. Can happen. It certainly can. You know, so uh, long term, how much we exercise, how many calories we burn up, 
and how many calories we take in do determine what our weight will be. But day to day and week to week, it just doesn't work that way. Anybody who's watched The Biggest Loser uh, has seen the shows where sometimes uh, the contestant will have lost 15 pounds uh, over a period of time. And then the next couple of weeks, they will do the same exercise and the same diet, and, and they'll lose two pounds and not 15 pounds. And uh, it's, not, it's not a straight curve, and so sometimes we do go through periods of time. But generally, it's what we eat and how much we exercise that determines our weight. Is it harder for someone to lose weight than another person? Yes, our metabolic rate changes, varies from person to person, so how easy it is. And some of that is the genetic thing. So my father was thin, I'm thin, uh, uh, and my father ate a lot, but was still able to remain thin. He had a high metabolic rate, and I'll, I'll say that uh, I eat mostly healthy food, but I eat a lot of food. And I, you know, uh, I have good friends who eat pretty much the same diet as me, who are 50, 60 pounds overweight. There is a difference in our genetic predisposition to how we hold on to body weight, a difference in our metabolic rate. When we talk about losing weight, we'll talk about metabolic rate again. Last one. I'm overweight, but I'm healthy. <laughs> yes. So you can be overweight and relatively healthy compared to other people who are overweight and not healthy. So uh, if you're overweight, you're more likely to have diabetes, more likely to have hypertension, uh, more likely to have some other health problems, but not everybody who's obese or overweight has those health problems. And so you can be overweight, obese, and healthier than other people. How much weight do you have to lose, or does it depend on the person? But generally, if a person loses 5 to 10% of their body weight, the health problems associated with obesity will get better. And that's maybe the most important thing I will say in this interview. You know, so many people who are overweight, obese, get discouraged because losing weight is so hard. Keeping weight off is even harder than losing weight and become so discouraged. And so many of us, you know, want to be at ideal body weight. And so if we're 50 pounds overweight, we determine we're going to lose 50 pounds. And that's pretty, Next week. That's, pretty, that's, pretty, that's pretty hard to do. And so just knowing that you lose 5 to 10 percent of your body weight will make a big difference in your health should be an encouragement to people who are working hard to lose weight and find it hard to lose a lot of weight. But losing a little bit of weight can make a big difference. According to the Centers for Disease Control's 2013 Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System, the rate of obesity is more than 10 percentage points higher among African Americans than whites. Obesity can impact a person's life in many ways. It can lead to other health problems like heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, and cancer. But it can also affect one's self-esteem and how that person is treated by others. We hear now from a woman who is doing her best to fight her personal battle against obesity. This is Eileen Wortham in her own words. Right now, uh, to the world, I weigh 250 pounds. I feel like I need to make a change. Uh, for the last couple of years, I have had a couple of health issues, and I'm spending more money on medicine and going back and forth to the doctors, and two of them have explained to me intensely, Ms. Wortham, you really need to lose weight. And then with some of my other, other underlying health issues, it has just given me grave concern. Coming from an African-American environment, culture, we believe in eating. And the choices of food that we had was mostly pork, uh, bread, sweets, <laughs> cookies, cake, cornbread, uh, fried chicken, fried fish, uh, any kind of, uh, as we would term today, unhealthy food. I've always been such a, a, a large young lady. and. Maybe in high school, I started having little bit of issues because you start getting interested in the opposite sex. But it was like, oh, that's the little chubby girl. And it was sort of like, okay, fine, you know, go on. Just kept myself busy. But still had the same uh, unhealthy 
eating habits. As I got into my 20s, marriage, children, my weight kept increasing, but it was like, it was okay, I got to raise the children, still teaching them to eat the homemade biscuits and cookies and pancakes, uh, anything like that. Then as I started getting into my 30s, my weight kept creeping up, um, depression, sadness, maybe a little uh, low self-esteem, got into my 40s. <laughs> I started going to the doctor more frequently, started having a lot of issues with my health. I am hypertension. Then in my late 40s, started having issues with my back, and I'm having knee surgery. And still kept hearing from the doctor, Miss Wortham, you really need to lose some weight. I love to eat. I, I, I'm an emotional eater. I discovered that about six, seven years ago. I get real upset. I eat. I, I, I use food as comfort. It's sad and it's pathetic that we judge people on how they look without truly getting to know them as a person. I believe we all should get respect no matter the outer shell. Do I get called names and I'm 55 years old? Yes, I still get names associated with my weight. Not my person, not my personality, but my body size. And you would think, okay, get over it, you know? <laughs> it ain't going anywhere right now. Not as quick as you want it to. So I, 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 that, 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 that's, uh, that's something else right there. So I, I try to keep positive goals and objectives in front of me. I have grandchildren and I want to be there for them and I want to be the grandmama that has fun with the, with the grandbabies. So it's just so much to live for and so much to do, but the choice is ours. It depends on what we want to do. Yes, you can be obese today, but it's up to you to decide, you know what, I don't have to be that way. I can move. Is it a if it's a fast progress, no. We didn't get overweight overnight, and it's not going to lose overnight. Wortham says she's in a weight loss program and has lost 32 pounds in 11 weeks. She's exercising and eating healthier. She says she wants to pass along those good habits to her family, friends, and co-workers. According to the State Department of Health, when it comes to the younger generation, over 40 percent of school-aged children and youth in Mississippi are either overweight or obese. We are joined now by Victor Sutton, Director of Preventive Health at the Mississippi State Department of Health. Victor, thank you for being with us on At Issue. What kind of reaction do you get from people who are obese? Um, you know, you get a, a number of reactions. Sometimes you get, to be quite honest, you get some, some despair, uh, some shame, um, some, I want to address this issue, but I don't know where to, where to start. And so you get a, a number of, of issues, and then you also get issues of folks that you would think are healthy, um, and weight is just one aspect of being healthy. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of aspects of being healthy, but you get a lot of a mixed reaction. How do you get to those folks? What, what do you do once you get to them to, to turn things around? Yeah, you know, we try to do what we call a, a, a culture of health, and that's what we, we're trying to approach it because it's a very compli complicated issue. Um, there are factors that some folks are predisposed by genetics, mm -hmm. um, by their parents. If they had two parents that have been obese, there's a there's a strong likelihood that your um, that your kids may be obese. Um, but we also understand that. Your genes, uh, your genetics, your genes don't affect your gene size, perhaps, and that's what we always kind of say, that that in of, a, in of itself doesn't really determine, but that is a factor. Um, we're looking at, you look at issues around your community, um, where you live, and those opportunities that's available to you, as, as we talked about, uh, being uh, more physically active, uh, being able to purchase and secure uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, and being and the other other issue, uh, Wilson is being, being able to afford them. Mm -hmm. uh, we often know that when you're eating out, that sometimes it's more expensive to uh, eat healthy, as opposed to going to a um, corner store, or going to a fast food, and getting what's on the value menu. And if you have uh, if you have a farmer's market nearby, you might not be able to use your benefits card to go or food stamps, as they were once known, to go and buy those uh, those items that might be better for you. So is there a way to to help those folks be able to accept that form of, fa of payment? Yes, we've been working with a number of farmers markets that um, helping them to be able to go through the process to, to 
use your EBT card, your food stamp card, mm -hmm. uh, as we call EBT card, to um, purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, a lot of farmers markets don't have that capability. Mm -hmm. And so if we can remove that particular barrier and work with farmers markets where, um, where they're established, help establish farmers markets where none are established, uh, it, it really goes to trying to, trying to make that healthy choice, easy choice. And that's one of the things that we try to do. We, the, we've got to make the healthy choice the default choice, the easy mm -hmm. choice uh, to make. We need to be able to go into restaurants and take a look and see what, what's available and what's on the healthy menu and let that jump out to you. Working with corner stores, and we talk about corner stores, we're talking about um, stores where you go in and you buy your chips and stuff. Where convenience there, stores. Convenience yeah. stores. Mm -hmm. Well, there may be some healthy op options in there, but they're not just intuitively obvious. And so we're working with stores to try to have a healthy section and so that those things uh, jump out at you. And, and you may notice around Mississippi where you're seeing those convenience stores um, selling bananas and apples mm -hmm. and some of those kind of things. And so that's kind of catching on. Isn't it a tough fight against the, the, the value meals and the, and the upsizing, the, the, the sugary drinks and that type of thing? I mean, that's so front and center in advertising and marketing and everything else. And at the same time, you're trying to preach the opposite in a lot of cases. Does it seem like an uphill battle sometimes? You, know, you make a great point, Wilson. Um, there are big bucks in marketing. And so, you know, when we're trying to promote this message, you're going against major corporations that have that have this down to a science and marketing to um, to individuals of all race, uh, social economic background, and different parts of the country, in in speaking to them and advertising to choose choose some of these items. Uh, we we do feel like we're gaining some ground. I think the um, the um, there's been great pushes from from the state, um, from CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and others with marketing campaigns understanding the value of, of, of living healthy and, and, and adopting a healthier lifestyle. The marketers and the advertisers obviously have a lot of money to put behind their campaigns. What kind of money does it take for you to get this word out and what kind of support do you get monetarily on the state level and on the federal level? Um, we, we, most of the dollars that we have in, in my particular office uh, are federal dollars. And so <clears> we <throat> compete nationally for grants to, um, to do programs, to promote evidence-based type activities, to try to help provide, make the healthy choice the easy choice to try to put um, programs in place to to change this whole culture of health. And we work in change this culture of health by working with faith-based communities as it relates to health ministries and what they can do at the church, uh, um, no fried chicken Sundays, um, churches having walking clubs, churches having screenings, um, working with work sites, work sites to understand that the value of healthier employees and what that means to the bottom line um, with, the, with the private sector. Uh, um, they're doing some amazing things around the state, providing clinics uh, in work sites, um, having a focus on healthier employees because we know healthier employees tend to be more productive. They take less time off work. Um, bottom line with workers' comp, they pull less from, the, from their um, from the health plan. And so there's a, lot, a number of different benefits for employers to um, invest in their employee around health. Um, working with the community, working with mayors. We do a lot with mayoral health councils, understanding that the mayor in their seat has an opportunity to really impact their community. Um, not only just employees of that particular community, whether it's healthy vending, healthy vending options, um, whether it's um, a number of different initiatives as it relates to um, uh, their particular community, when we talk about walking communities, um, <clears throat> providing back, um, bike trails, walking trails in their uh, community and, and understanding the benefit of those things. And, and as we talk about facilities where in a lot of urban areas in Mississippi, of what we call urban, uh, there's access to gyms and there's access to fitness um, places. And in a lot of places around our state, there's not access to those things. But um, working with schools and, and talking about shared use agreements, there's opportunities to open up those schools to that particular community. 
And you're talking about for the community to come in and use this tax-funded schools, uh, playground facilities or workout facilities for their for their ball teams, that type of thing, where the community could come in and, and, and use those facilities. Correct. We call those <laughs> shared use agreements. And what, what it is is pretty much a partnership between a school and an organization, a school and a community, a school and, a, and, a, and, a, and another group to open up their facilities. Uh, again, there's oftentimes there's a gym with schools, there's a track, um, there, there's green space for kids to play on fields and those kind of things. And those are facilities that we have in our, in our communities where we may not have workout facilities and there may be a call store, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Those things are available. Um, they, they oftentimes provide a safe and healthy place to exercise for, for you and your family and those kind of things. And they're located all over the state. So it's a real um, prime opportunity to um, increase and promote physical activity and to, decre and to decrease physical inactivity. So if someone out there is watching and knows there's a school nearby that gets locked up in the summertime and they'd like to make use of the facilities, uh, should they call the health department to find out how to how to reach one of these agreements? You know, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think it's twofold. You can call the health department. You can and can reach out to the Office of Preventive Health, and we can start initiating contact mm -hmm. because it's a process. And then there's oftentimes. Um, contacting the school and see what's available. Mm -hmm. there, there may be some things in place at certain times that the community may or may not be aware of. There's also a number of uh, school health councils that's located around around the state. Um, school health councils looking at opportunities to make their school healthier and, and providing healthier options at ball games and those kind of things and really providing some choices where in the past the, the choices always have been unhealthy choices. Victor Sutton, Director of Preventive Health at the Mississippi State Department of Health. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are out of time. Don't forget, you can check out the program on our website, mpbonline.org issue. And please join us again next Friday night here on MPB for another edition of At Issue. Good night.